Okay, so I guess I'll start here. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Philip Carter. Uh, I work at Microsoft on the F Sharp and .NET compilers team, um, or rather it's the .NET team and there's like different sub teams and one of those sub teams has some F Sharp and compiler stuff and, and that's sort of what I work on. Um, I've been working in this space for the past four years now, um, focusing a lot on F Sharp and kind of helping drive some of the more uh, modern things that we've been doing with the language and um, I'm excited to talk to you today about, you know, a different topic, one that I've, I've never actually given before and one that I hope to be speaking a lot more about in the future. Um, I called this talk F sharp as a better Python, but uh, it's, it's more, it's, it's pretty much just going to be about F sharp. It's not really going to be talking about Python very much and I'm not going to be spending a lot of time doing like this side-by-side -side comparison of like, oh, F -sharp, here's F-sharp code, look how better it is in the C-sharp code. And you know, it's, I find that to oftentimes be a little bit unproductive, like it can be helpful, but um, don't get me wrong about that. But I'm kind of more interested in Python as a means to accomplishing things in a given space and how F-sharp can fulfill that same need. Um, and I personally think that F-sharp can do a lot of these things better than Python, which is what I, I want to end up focusing on. So um, first, let me talk about F sharp kind of in a nutshell, uh, very briefly. So F sharp, it's, we call it the functional language for .NET. It's functional programming language, runs on .NET, it's been running on .NET for a long time, um, runs on .NET Core, runs cross platform, yada, yada, yada. Um, but what I think what's a little bit interesting is the code, F sharp code looks a lot more like Python than it does C sharp. Right, C sharp code looks absolutely nothing like this, but a lot of Python code is surprisingly similar, like from a syntactical standpoint, which is one of the reasons why I think some people who are familiar with Python might find themselves enjoying uh, using F sharp code. And so, on the left hand side, we actually have a web application running on the ASP.NET Core uh, with a library called Giraffe. And what's interesting is Giraffe is this fantastic. Um, library that was inspired by a different library called Suave a while ago. And um, what it does is it sort of takes this, this functional programming nature of, you know, focusing on functions, focusing on inputs and outputs, and it lifts that in directly into the routing abstractions, right? So an API route in a web application, for example, is actually just a function that accepts an input and then produces an output. And it's very similar to how, you know, HTTP works, right? It's, you're really reasoning about inputs and outputs. And so that's what goes on here and it ends up working out very, very well. And on the right hand side, uh, here's an example of using some types for numeric uh, stuff. Uh, this S map is kind of a sliceable map. It's a, it's a custom data type in the library where I, I pulled some code from. Um, and what's interesting is this is all about, um, Let's see, it looks like my, my screen got booted here. Sorry about that. Um, so the, this, these sort of like list comprehension sort of things that you can do, these sort of being able to generate data on the fly, slice it and index it on the fly. This is a sort of thing that's actually fairly common, especially if you're doing numeric style programming in F-sharp. Um, and again, it's sort of Pythonic and it's a very different way of programming compared to say C Sharp or Java or Visual Basic or things like that. Um, and so that's why, you know, this talk isn't about F Sharp is a better C Sharp, it's F Sharp is a better Python because um, it looks Pythonic and as I'll go into it a little bit more, we're exploring spaces that Python excels in today and uh, making the case that F Sharp can be used in those same places. So. The first one, which I think is perhaps the most important to talk about in the beginning is F sharp for the web, because shocker, Python is also used for the web. It's incredibly popular for building web applications, actually. Um, between Django and uh, Flask, I, I think the, those two libraries alone account for the, the, the lion's share of Python usage on the web. And you know, entire businesses are built on this stuff. Um, well. F sharp can be used for the web too. And not only can it be used for the web, it's actually really, really good on the web, especially on the server. Right? And that's because it relies on ASP.NET Core, which is the high performance web server for .NET. Uh, it's incredibly mature, but also very extensible. And the extensibility part is important because not only does it run fast, but it allows you to build bindings on top of it that sort of make 
you know, uh, allow you to, to use more than just like the base abstractions and the base, you know, MVC abstractions that come with, you know, a typical C sharp application running on ASP.NET Core. And in fact, there's three libraries that I want to call out in particular Giraffe, Saturn, and Falco. All three um, take advantage of ASP.NET Core extensibility and use um, features in F sharp that really sort of like highlight the differences and, and make it, you know, feel like it's really native to F sharp. Um, the other thing that's important is F sharp is full access to the modern .NET ecosystem. So all of our libraries and SDKs that you would expect to be able to work in pretty much every single major environment, uh, you can you can get that to work in F sharp. You can consume all these libraries. You can produce libraries that you know C sharp developers can consume if you if you need that to uh, to happen for your business. Um, F sharp is fantastic on the server. In fact. Um, uh, I would say that it's in some ways better than Python. Um, you know, benchmarks, you can, you can always fudge a benchmark. You can make some stuff look way better than other things. But um, we found that the uh, tech and power benchmarks are pretty good overall. It's pretty hard to cheat in those things. Um, and F Sharp outperforms Python in uh, a large variety of tests across different test runs. Uh, this is Zebra and Giraffe. These are two frameworks. Zebra is a bit more experimental, but Giraffe is, is something that a lot of people use their business today. Um, if you want performance, you can use F Sharp and you won't have to worry about it, which I think matters a lot. But F Sharp isn't just for like the web server side of doing web development. You can actually compile F Sharp to JavaScript. And there's two major projects that sort of enable that that I would encourage you to check out. Um, the first is called Fable. Fable is this open source project that was started a few years ago, and its focus on um, it, it, it literally takes actually the F-sharp compiler itself, and it takes the F-sharp syntax tree, converts it into a JavaScript syntax tree. And then from that point on, you're, you're using F-sharp, but you're operating in a different context, right? You're not, you're not in .NET, you know, transpiling and emitting some garbage JavaScript that like hopefully a browser is able to, you know, do something with. Um, when you're using a library in a Fable application, you're using an NPM library. You're, you're not using NuGet. Um, when you're producing a library, you're producing an NPM package. Um, when you're building your application, you're using JavaScript-based building tools. Um, when you are, you know, testing stuff out in the browser, they have like, you know, this hot reload sort of thing, and you and you can, um, or rather, I think it's called hot module reload, where you can update just a tiny part of the UI and have only that part refresh in your browser to make sure that it's all working. It's all based off of JavaScript tooling. You're 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 using F Sharp, but you're living fundamentally in the JavaScript world. And this model view update app architecture is this thing that was uh, pioneered actually by the Elm programming language, but was brought into F Sharp via Fable. Um, and has since become a fairly popular way to build applications in the F Sharp community. Uh, the other project that I want to call out for using F Sharp with, you know, to sort of produce JavaScript that you can run in a browser is Web Sharper, which is, it's been around for a very long time. Um, it's sort of changed as the web has changed and as F Sharp has changed. Um, but it's an enterprise grade full stack F Sharp development experience where you have F Sharp on the server and F Sharp on the client. They can talk to each other and it all just works. Um, there, there's sort of a, a bit of a, the way that I'll contrast them because they're both great is Fable is more about you kind of assembling your own stack to sort of fit your own needs. And Web Sharper is sort of this, you know, hey, you got the batteries included, turnkey, you can just start going and you have a great support contract for the company that um, builds Web Sharper. And so it's important because, you know, a lot of developers, frankly, don't like writing JavaScript code. Um, JavaScript isn't like horrible or anything, but it's got some parts that are not that great. And when you use F Sharp instead of JavaScript, you end up having a much better time because it's it's a bit more sound as, as a language. Um, but it's also not just about JavaScript because F Sharp can also compile to WebAssembly. Uh, the same folks that have built Web Sharper have also built a project called Bolero, which is where actually a lot of their focus is right now. Um, you use the same app architecture, model view update, which you can see a little bit of an, of an example here. Um, but instead of transpiling to JavaScript and then, you know, being interpreted by your browser, that sort of stuff, it just, it, it's actually F sharp.net code itself that is then run via WebAssembly. Um, 
And it has full hot reloading support as well, which is pretty great. It's actually based off of some lower level components of Blazor. So as Blazor evolves and gets better, Bolero also evolves and gets better, basically for free. Um, and there's no JavaScript involved. It's pretty great. It's, it's a really cool thing that I encourage you to check out, especially if you want to try out WebAssembly. So um, F Sharp is great on the server. If you, if you want to sort of avoid some of the problems with JavaScript, if you will, uh, you can have F Sharp compile the JavaScript, and you have a couple of different choices that are pretty great. And if you want to blaze some new trails, a little bit. You can use F Sharp with WebAssembly for your UIs. And this is something that I'm very, actually very excited to uh, see spring up in the F Sharp community. And as this WebAssembly stuff gets better, I, I think we're going to be able to make a legitimate case that you can um, eliminate most of your JavaScript and just legitimately write F Sharp code completely end to end and have all environments sort of understand it. <clears throat> so I want to take a brief aside about how we got here, because I'm going to talk more about this Python stuff later. Um, but everything that I told you about so far was aligned with Donna Core. And this slide is called Recent F Sharp History, but it might as well say .NET Core F Sharp History, because that's really what this is all about. Right? Over the past about four years now, if you count the development leading up to F Sharp 4.1, um, we have been focused almost exclusively on making sure that F Sharp is great with Donna Core. And so in 2017, we released initial support with that and along with some other uh, languages. About a year and a half later with F Sharp 4.5 came some low level programming support for Donna Core to be able to do use span of T, use by reflex structs, be able to do the high performance coding that you need to do sometimes. Uh, a few months later, we released F Sharp 4.6, which included anonymous records, a, a Feature that is, is one of those that you find yourself using a lot and you, you don't really think about it. It's just sort of, it's, you're, you're just sort of programming and boom, oh, I could use an anonymous record. I'll just do that and you move on. And a lot of uh, Visual Studio IDE performance work. And then a few months later after that, F Sharp 4.7 released with importantly preview feature infrastructure. So we have the ability now with the F Sharp compiler to be able to release preview features alongside a um, released F Sharp compiler allow you to toggle a flag and say, hey, I want to use preview features, try it out. And then you can give us feedback on if these preview features make sense, if you think that we made the right decisions, um, and we can make adjustments. You know, and, and then eventually, sort of once we feel like a given preview feature is good enough from a design and implementation standpoint to promote to a full language feature, we can do that. And that's actually the first thing that's happening with F -sharp 4 uh, sorry, F -sharp 5.0. When I say lots of things, I, I really mean actually lots of preview features that are going to be promoted to um, non-preview here pretty shortly. And so this is all about recent F Sharp history. It's sort of like uh, an era, if you will, like the .NET Core era. But I'm going to make the case that F Sharp 5, which we're releasing later in this fall, is the end of that era. And it's going to be the start of a new one. Now, that isn't to say that we're done with F Sharp and .NET Core and making sure that F Sharp is great on the server and you know all of these things that you could do with Python and C Sharp on the server to build web applications. Like there's still work that needs to go on, go into that. There's still bug fixes. There's still some little tweaks that we could make. In fact, there's even a new feature that we're thinking of shipping next year instead of this year that will make things even better. Um, but Largely, our goals there were to make sure that F Sharp is awesome with .NET Core, and, and really that sort of means making sure that F Sharp is great cross-platform for building modern applications, um, which I think is really important in this day and age. But that work is sort of largely complete in a way, um, I, and so you know the work is never done. But our major, our goals have been mostly accomplished, and so there's sort of this question of, well, what do we do next, right? Um, could oversimplify it and say go after the spaces that Python is going, but you know it's it's a little bit more nuanced than that, and I'll try to communicate that here. So F sharp five, I, I'm not really going to say like what exactly F sharp five is because uh, people, the way that people interpret a language is sort of it's really sort of up to them. But I will say that we emphasize sort of three major things: uh, interactive programming, analytical workloads, and what I'm calling great fundamentals. Great fundamentals, kind of like hand wavy, you know, okay, cool, you're just making sure that it's good. Um, 
Well, what I mean by that is interactive programming and analytical workloads. Those are like specific things that I'll that I'll be explaining a little bit here. And great fundamentals means that we're not just going to graft on something that like takes a box on a checklist for interactive programming or analytical workloads. Said, ah, yes, we've accomplished this. Moving on now. Um, it's about very thoughtfully incorporating things so that you know interactive programming and doing analytical stuff with F# -sharp is better than it was before, but in a way that you're using features that are generally useful to people and not only useful for people who are in, you know, that particular bucket of, you know, oh, I'm doing data science. I get my data science feature. Very cool. Um, we're trying to be very thoughtful with this because languages are permanent in terms of once you add things to them, you can't just go rip out a feature because people depend on it. And so we want to make sure that we do the right thing and we do it carefully but and thoughtfully so this is what we emphasize so interactive and analytical does does that sound at all familiar to to anyone here related to python python completely owns this space today there is no question that if you're doing interactive programming and analytical work you're either going to be you're either using python already or you're going to be using python at some point that's just that's just the way that the world is today. And I don't know if we all sort of know exactly how it got there. I have my own hypotheses related to very gradual growth and you know, very careful building of libraries that make sense for people over a very long period of time and you know, have that finally be recognized over the past five years. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you're doing interactive programming with, say, Jupyter Notebooks, you're probably using Python. And this is important because it's not just programmers and data scientists, people doing machine learning who are doing this. This is, this is people in education. This is people in the sciences who may not necessarily view uh, their programming language as you know, a way to build applications, but rather as a way to learn something about the domain that they're operating in. This is something that in particular, um, you know, F Sharp has been okay at, but .NET as a whole has not really been very good at. Right? .NET has always been about building applications, um, but there's this entire group of programmers that is growing a lot, and they're not really building applications. They're really sort of using code as a, as a means to an end. And yes, maybe, maybe things get incorporated into an application, right? Maybe you're a data scientist who you have a math background, um, and you write a little bit of code and you help your software developers to incorporate a model that you built into the greater application. That's totally fine. Um, but this is important and this is what we want to go after because we think this is a way to grow .NET. This is a way to grow F Sharp, especially in a way that is unique from C Sharp. You know, we're not, you know, having to sort of ride on the coattails of C Sharp and .NET Core. We can, we can say, aha, we're here, we're in a place we want to be. Let's go after some people where we think we can truly excel. So interactive programming. Interactivity in programming is sort of like you know, you're not building an application, you're building something that, well, you interact with. You're, you're constantly sort of adjusting it and getting it to a point where you, you sort of want to do things. And, and believe it or not, F Sharp has quite a history here. Uh, this is a wonderful little picture of using F Sharp with Visual Studio and Windows XP. Very old, I believe this is Visual Studio 2005. Uh, and this is actually the F Sharp interactive process. Um, you can sort of see it uh, at the bottom of the picture there, uh, generating a surface plot. Right, so this has been actually been around for quite a while. Um, being able to, you can reference assemblies with F Sharp Interactive today. You can load other F Sharp scripts and sort of load them into the context of you know the thing that you're operating in, and and maybe have multiple scripts that do certain certain tasks. You could break up the work that way. And there's IDE integration in Visual Studio, and now Visual Studio Code and uh, JetBrains Writer and um, other IDEs as well. There's also more than just F Sharp Interactive. In fact, the F Sharp community has built Actually, a Jupyter kernel back in the day called IF Sharp that is still um, maintained a little bit by one of the fine folks at Microsoft Research. Um, and I'll talk about how that's sort of going to be obviated by uh, you know some some product work that we're doing here. Um, the Fable project that I mentioned before has an online REPL that allows you to interactively build out a UI um, entirely within your browser. And there have been other IDEs that have focused on interactivity over the years in the F Sharp community. So it's not like this is entirely new ground that we're treading here, but 
what's worth calling out is from Microsoft's perspective, right? You know, Microsoft engineers have built out F Sharp Interactive, the core infrastructure that enables certain things. But then around 2014, I'd say, it kind of just stopped. Um, that isn't to say that it was the wrong thing to do, right? You know, the, there was a lot of work that had to go into supporting .NET Core, and you know, we ultimately think that was the right decision. But we hadn't really invested in core interactive experiences. Right? We had built lower level infrastructure, but then sort of just left it there. Um, this is something that we want to pick up again because we think this is sort of a new frontier for uh, getting people to try out F Sharp and functional programming and .NET. So with F Sharp 5, we're doing the first bit of this. So we're dialing it up a notch. You can see on the right hand side, this is a screenshot of a Jupyter Notebook where I'm referencing a package, newtonsoft.json. Any .NET developer should probably know exactly what that is. But what you notice here is I didn't, there, there's no, there's no like, you know, oh, behind the scenes, Philip must have, you know, run some command on his machine and, and done this sort of thing. And then, he, you know, he's lying, right? I can't just literally say pound r nougat colon newtonsoft.json and then just get newtonsoft.json, can I? Well, the answer actually is yes, you can. Um, and I'll show you that a little bit here. Uh, the other thing is it's not just about being able to reference NuGet packages, but we want to focus on overall experiences, not just low level infrastructure, but high level what you're doing inside of Jupyter Notebooks and VS Code Notebooks. Um, the Jupyter Notebook support is fairly stable at this point. VS Code Notebooks is a bit, um, there's a lot more work that has to go into those experiences, which we're hoping to release later this year with F-Sharp 5 in November. Um, but I personally think the VS Code stuff is really awesome. And so that's what I want to demo. So let me pull up Visual Studio Code. So I have this file on the left-hand side. It's a .dib. Uh, this is the file extension used for, for VS Code notebooks. I'm going to go ahead and open this. So, before I go through exact, you know, all of this sort of stuff, actually, just let me close this so you're not uh, distracted here. One thing I want to call out is all I've done is installed Visual Studio Code Insiders. I went to my extensions. Um, I, I downloaded this uh, rainbow CSV thing because it, it, it makes CSVs nicer to work with. But actually, all I've gone and done is I've installed a single plugin called .NET Interactive Notebooks. This is a preview plugin, so you know it's still all preview. It, it won't be later this year, um, but that's it. I didn't have to do anything special. I didn't have to go and download. You know, I didn't have to make a decision between if I want to use Docker containers, PyEnv, PipEnv, Anaconda, Miniconda to be able to get a stable environment to do stuff with. I just had to download a single extension, and that's it. And so when I open up one of these files. Uh, if this is the very first time, what it does is it goes and it, it downloads all of the necessary dependencies and places them in an isolated location and knows how to point them there. And then boom, you're there. So let's go through some of the stuff that we can do here with F Sharp. And actually, interestingly enough, the first thing I'm going to do is execute some PowerShell rather than F Sharp. Um, I could have written this code to download these three CSVs in F Sharp. Um, but it just so happens that the act of downloading a file and placing it somewhere on your machine is extremely optimized in PowerShell. It's just so little PowerShell to actually do that. So I just went ahead and did that. So I'm going to execute that cell. And boom, you can see on the left hand side, I get some CSVs. So here's this confirmed deaths recovers. This is some COVID data that um, we pulled off of some John Hopkins uh, GitHub repo here. Um, so we got the data. Let's do some stuff with it. So the first thing is I'm actually going to be uh, supplying a type extension for um, something. This is to enable something I want to do later. We're just probably going to add this to the F-Sharp core library so you don't have to do this. But so I've downloaded the data, but now I need to clean it up a little bit. So how do you do this? Well, open up some namespaces to my system for regular dimensions. And um, I have a single function here called this. Well, looks like we got some noise coming in the top here. No. From Regan, is there a way to mute? No, it doesn't flick it. Um, sorry about that. Excuse me, Regan, it looks like your mic is on. We'll do, uh, 
um, hear your keyboard clacking. Okay, so um, anyways, I can have a function that I'm gonna call clean. And in this case, I'm just taking a single uh, parameter path. I'm gonna read that into a uh, just sort of the raw CSV. I'm gonna create a regex. And I'm going to just replace some stuff with the regex, and then I'm going to write that back into the file. And then I'm just going to call that function for confirm.csv, death.csv, and recover.csv. Then I'm going to emit a string. So I'll run that. All cleaned up. Okay, so it modified those files, cleaned them up a little bit so that I can do stuff with it. So moving on now, I have a little markdown script here. Um, what's great is you can actually just read this as a document after it's all completed. So now we're going to load it into a data frame. Well, how do I get a data frame? Well, let's install one with NuGet. All right. So it went ahead and it downloaded Microsoft.data.analysis, which is a preview package for doing well, data analysis, as the name would suggest. And let's go ahead and do some stuff with that. So there's a little bit more code here. I'm going to load each of these CSVs into a data frame called Deaths Recovered and Confirmed and Recovered. And then I'm going to set a display value. This display function is kind of like this magic function that we have in .NET Interactive. And it's just going to say processing data. And I'm going to do some stuff. Um, it's kind of a for loop here, this, this offset thing. If you'll notice, the reason why that's there is um, there's like one, two, three, four. There's like zero, one, two, three, and then four. And then this is some date information. This is here. So we want to, when we're reading this CSV, we want to initially ignore these, these first columns here. So that's what's going to be going on. All right. Cool. So I'm um, going to be doing just a simple for loop here, you know, for i equals offset devs.coms.count. There's probably a number of different ways that you could write this, but, you know, for loop is pretty easy to understand. I'm going to extract to the current date that I'm looking at. I'm going to look at the, the deaths, the confirmed cases, and the recovered cases that are based off of um, you know, the current position in each CF, CSV that I'm in. I'm then just going to display a value in the notebook itself saying, hey, this is the thing that we're processing right now. And then I'm going to produce an object. So this is an F-sharp anonymous record. Notice that it's denoted by this, this little curly bracket sort of thing right here. So this whole thing is a record, and it's actually containing other records inside of it. So the first is it's going to just have a thing called date, which is just the date. There's going to be um, deaths associated with that date. Those deaths are going to have, you know, um, it's sort of going to be like this. Uh, there's going to be a latitude and a longitude and a, you know, some data, basically. Um, confirmed cases and recovered cases are the exact same thing. It's just they're going to be looking at data inside of these um, confirmed.csv and recovered.csv files. And then what I'm going to do is there's this, it's called a resize array. It's, it's sort of the same thing as a system dot, uh, collections dot generic of list of T. And I'm just going to go ahead and add uh, the instance of this data that I've constructed inside of this for loop to the series. And it's going to do that for, you know, every value inside of the CSV. And then when I'm done, it's just going to print time to the screen. So I'll execute that processing a bunch of different dates and it's done. Cool. All right. That's pretty simple. So now I have everything loaded into my series. So let's go ahead and try a plot. Right. So what I'm actually going to be using is a uh, library called xplot. xplot um, ultimately compiles stuff down into JavaScript. And then that JavaScript is going to be using a JavaScript plotting library called Plotly. So the first thing is I'm going to construct this layout object. Um, this is the sort of thing that it's kind of, it's a little bit futzy because um, you know, you got to learn the specifics of the library to really make much use out of it. But ultimately, I'm going to want to um, produce what I'm, what's called a scatter geo, right? So there's going to be a layout, there's going to be a font, a title, sort of a background color. Um, what the, the geo is, in this case, it's sort of like a, a you know, the picture of the world. And we're going to be placing some stuff on it. And so in this case, you'll notice the scatter geo, there's going to be a name, a mode, geo is called geo, blah, blah, blah. Latitude, longitude, text, marker. This is where data is going to be coming from. In this case, there's, you know, in the series, I'm just going to look at the very first item and I'm going to get, you know, this is, I'm basically looking at recovered cases. So 
So the first recovered case and where that is. All right, so displayed a, a big old map here and no surprise, the first covered, the first recovered case is in mainland of China where the, uh, where the virus originated from. So let's say I wanted to look at the last data in the series. Just typing a special character here. This is the reverse index stuff that's kind of from up here. This is saying that I want to look at zero from the end, basically the last item. We'll take a look at that. And there's a whole lot more recoveries, as you would imagine, because this is the last item in the data set from um, 6, 10, 20, at least in the, in the data that we're looking at. I don't, I don't think that's quite, um, probably not 100% representative, or well, maybe it is. There's a bunch of data here. It, it, there, there's ways to like kind of clean up this plot. But I think what's important to sort of note here is I'm just writing some F sharp code. I'm not, and like I can pull in multiple libraries and I don't really have to worry about it. I, I can just install an environment really simply. I can just start writing some code and it works with, with these tools directly, which is pretty great. And um, just for good measure, say I want to convert this into an IPYNB file. This is actually the Jupyter Notebooks um, uh, file format so that I could share it with, say maybe I have a coworker who's not using VS Code Notebooks. They're actually using Jupyter Lab, which is uh, sort of an IDE for um, Jupyter Notebooks. Well, I could work in this case, do all my stuff in F Sharp. I could then just export it as an IPYNB file. I could just give them that notebook. And then all they have to do is just make sure that they have the F Sharp kernel installed um, in their environment, which is actually just as simple as installing a single global tool called .NET Interactive. And that will actually go ahead and install all the language kernels. And they can just work directly with this um, IPYNB file. So let's go back here. So a few things to sort of uh, summarize with that. So acquisition and installation is very, very simple for using F Sharp with notebooks, right? Um, for those of you who have done any like serious work in Python, you're probably well aware that it is very easy to potentially corrupt your system installation. Um, so you have to install a given environment, right? And so, you know, oftentimes you're just gonna be installing an Anaconda or Miniconda depending on your needs. But there's a lot of choices that you have to make and you kind of got to be careful. Additionally, and I didn't, I didn't really call this out very much, but say you are in a Jupyter notebook with doing Python work today and you have to use a package that's not a part of, say, your Anaconda distribution, right? It's external to that distribution. That's perhaps unlikely, but you still, you may, you may be in that environment. Well, you have two choices. You could stop your work in the notebook. You could install that dependency into that environment and then restart your work and go on and do that, kind of, you know, take a break and do that. Or you could know some magic code that you have to type inside of your uh, Pi, I'm sorry, inside of your notebook that um, will use your, your pip installation to go ahead and install it for you, but it has to do it safely. And so you have to know exactly how to do that safely. And there's a, it's kind of high friction. That's not a problem that you have when you're in F Sharp and notebooks with it, which I think is pretty important. The other thing is, um, I didn't show this off very, I didn't show this off at all actually, but interoperability is something that we're doing, being able to interop with C Sharp and F Sharp. It's actually supported today. There's a few quirks, um, but you know, I can export a value from F Sharp and consume it inside of a C Sharp cell inside of the same notebook. I can do that um, in VS Code notebooks. I can also do that in Jupyter notebooks. And that's something that we're hardening for the release so that we can interoperate cleanly between the two languages. The other thing that's worth calling out is it's not just about C-sharp and F-sharp interop. Um, let's say I didn't want to use Plotly and I wanted to use a different, say, JavaScript-based uh, plotting library. Well, I could actually do that. Uh, there's a way that you can export um, just F-sharp values and have them be, they, they're seri they, they, in the background, they get serialized as JSON. And then you can import that from say, just some JavaScript code inside of a JavaScript cell. Uh, this is something that we have working to some degree right now. There's, I, I'm operating off of a dev build. I've been a little bit nervous trying to uh, 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 do that. I think the first preview of this is gonna be releasing fairly soon and then we'll have that capability in there. Um, but 
we also want to extend that to Python. So it then becomes not really a question of F sharp versus Python, but F sharp alongside Python, right? Because the reality is Python has incredible library support that you would be a fool not to use in you know, a number of circumstances. But you may prefer F sharp for like, I don't know, like maybe cleaning and interpreting your data, but then say you want to plot it and there's a particular Python plotting library that you really love. Or say it's the inverse. Um, you have some Python data, but then you want to consume it in, in, uh, in F sharp and do something else with it. Um, using a common interface with uh, JSON serialization inside of the notebook and be able to just sort of what we call do variable sharing is something that we're striving to do here. And this is all going to be going GA um, in this fall, you know, if everything goes well. So this is something that we're definitely very excited to, to do here. So there's more to interactive programming, there's more I could have shown you, but you know, I don't want to run over time. So the other thing that I sort of called out explicitly about F-Sharp 5, analytical workloads, it's kind of a weird phrase. So what does that mean? Well, um, first thing I, I did is I shopped for three stock images of people looking like they're thinking. Um, you can tell that they're very deep in thought here, uh, just as I was pondering what analytical workloads meant. But so what I really mean by that is, you know, sort of all of the above with respect to data access, manipulating data, analyzing data, doing some machine learning, or we call it AI if we're talking to people who are you know, not familiar with the term. Um, sometimes just a bunch of math stuff, right? And like math stuff that can be like, you know, for game development, or it can be for, you know, all, all sorts of like math is sort of everywhere. And especially for, I mean, machine learning is really just math actually. So um, that's something that's growing. Math is growing. You gotta be good at that stuff if you operate in space. Uh, that's sort of what this, this whole thing means. And it's not really new, right? You know, all of these things like data access and data manipulation has been around forever. Um, anybody who's been doing any serious database work knows exactly what that's all about. They just use a different language called SQL. Um, but this is something that F-Sharp has also been pretty good at over the years that we want to emphasize and make better, right? So specifically in terms of F-Sharp 5, there's sort of this question, what does it mean, right? You say, okay, Philip, you want to go off and do this, all this math stuff, cool. But like, what does that actually mean? Um, well, the first thing is we want to make working with collections, built-in collection types, just a little bit easier. We want to uh, interoperate with some new .NET initiatives pretty well, right? ML.NET, Spark.NET, the data frames library. Um, they use some specific constructs that preview prior to F Sharp 5 used to be a little bit more awkward to work with. We want to make that less awkward. Um, another thing is we want to give library authors who want to work in this space better tools for abstraction, right? Um, the lifeblood of this space in Python is its libraries. And so by extension, that also has to be true for F Sharp, right? F Sharp needs to have good libraries coming from people who are passionate about this space. And we want to make sure that they have the tools to actually do that, right? So they're not fighting against the language at every step trying to do what they want to do. And finally, um, we want to translate F Sharp to some different environments, right? We have some ongoing research work right now about executing um, F Sharp code as what we call AI models and translating the syntax tree into um, a PyTorch environment and then running it there. Uh, but what's interesting is in that translation, we actually retain all of the type safety that f -sharp gets today that you don't have when you're using Python. Um, similarly, we wanna run on a more common uh, model format, which we're, you know, a, a lot of the industry is centralizing on Onyx um, to do that sort of thing. We wanna make sure f -sharp runs very, very well on the Onyx runtime. More demo time about F sharp five specific stuff. Okay, so I had this COVID.dib. I'm just gonna close that. Go to .NET Interactive. And I'm going to convert a Jupyter notebook to a .NET Interactive notebook. Let's go ahead and find it. F sharp five, we'll call that F sharp five.dib. All right. So I had this IPYNB file. Jupyter Notebooks, by the way, when you don't have the UI, they're just a big old blob of, uh, of JSON. But now I have f sharp 5dib And boom, oh, look at that. That looks a lot nicer. So um, this is actually a Jupyter Notebook that I've been uh, sharing with people since the very first preview of f sharp 5 um, that I'll sort of walk through because it shows 
some pretty cool stuff. So what we've seen before, be able to reference a package in F Sharp Interactive and execute it. In this case, same thing, download Newtonsoft JSON, use it. I'm constructing an F Sharp anonymous record. I'm serializing that. I get it back as output. Pretty straightforward. Let me blow that up just a little bit bigger. Okay, cool. So one of the things that we're doing concretely is better interop with nullable value types, right? Um, they've typically been a bit of a pain in F sharp. It's not that, you know, they were like incorrect or anything like that. It's just they were perhaps a little bit too correct, right? There's a very strong motivation to use nullable value types when you're working with uh, data science sort of stuff. Um, and you had to be very explicit about what you were doing in um, F sharp prior to uh, F sharp five, right? There's two lines of code that I'm just going to execute here. This is there, there's no output. I'm just sort of compiling. But what's what's important is I'm creating this thing called a primitive data frame call of of type date time. The actual values inside of that are not date times. They are nullable value types that it may be null or date time. And so prior to F sharp five, if I wanted to add one, I had to actually call nullable, you know, parameterized with date time and then pass in the value and do that every single time. It's kind of annoying. And so we just have this sort of type directed rule is what we call it, where we just sort of say like, hey, we see that this thing is a nullable of this thing. You're passing in one of these things. So we'll just construct the nullable for you. Um, this is something that it's not like the biggest, fanciest, flashiest feature, but it's one of those that, you know, you, you just feel like the language is working with you as you're working with that package. So moving on there. Oh, my cats are meowing. I don't know if you can hear that, but they desperately want inside of the room that I'm working in right now. Um, so uh, the uh, next important one is what we're calling tolerant and consistent slices, right? So basically, there used to be some just dumb behavior in F sharp if you thought about it, right? So this is some some horribly contrived code that is obviously nonsensical, right? I have I have a, a, a list, an array, and a string that I've constructed, and I want to extract a slice from negative two to negative one. That that's just nonsense, right? And I'm going to get the length. Well, so the, the one problem that we had prior to F sharp five is lists would not throw, but then arrays and strings would throw if you did that. We're actually going to move them to not throw. And the reason why is because empty lists in F sharp compose with lists, right? You can add an empty list to an existing list. It just works. Same thing with arrays, same thing with strings. We felt like it made sense. Another one is we have built in 3D and 4D array slice types. Um, Oh, it looks like this markdown table doesn't format. That's unfortunate. But so basically, you could imagine a three dimensional array, you know, going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, where 0, 1, 2, 3 are in uh, one Z dimension, and then 4, 5, 6, and 7 are in another, or in another Z dimension. And let's say I'm giving an instance of this array, and I want to extract a slice of 4, 5. I want to get this vector out of this three dimensional array. So the question of, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, so there's slicing syntax to do that, but prior to F sharp five, you couldn't actually do this um, very well. You had to write some custom code. So in this case, I'm just going to fill up an array or a matrix, I guess I'm calling it, and just giving it that same data. And then I'm going to extract the four or five slice. All this is doing is saying, I don't care about the, the X dimension. I want the zeroth in the Y dimension. I want the, the, the zeroth value in the Y dimension, and then I want the the for the value in the first dimension uh, sorry the for the value in the first thingy of the the z dimension sorry it's a little early in the morning so my uh my words get a little slurred here um but so anyways as you can see this extracts a four or five vector um which is exactly what we wanted prior to f sharp five you could not write this line of code this is just one of those things that you know if, if you're coming from python you kind of expect these things to sort of just work and this is what um, we're striving for. We're also doing from the end slicing and indexing. So in this case, I have another list from one to 10, and I'm gonna get one element from the end. Boom, I just do that, it's the value nine. It's exactly what you would expect. It's team to call. Um, and let's say I wanna compare the, the old style with the new style. Prior to F sharp five, you had to write this nonsense. <laughs> I had to go, you know, this x is dot length minus two and then dot dot, which basically says everything from this point up until the end. 
now I can just go from one from the end, or you know, I could change that instead of one, it could be x from the end, right? You can imagine that. Okay, so you see they produce the same value. What's interesting is it's not just built-in types that support this, right? I can actually take a type that I don't own, right? Span of t. This is this is defined in uh, .NET Core, and I can extend it to provide an F# -sharp slice and provide a, re a reverse index. This is via a type extension. This is where things start to get very interesting, especially for library authors, because some people are going to be working with data types that they did not define themselves, but they want to be able to do useful things with them. Well, as a library author, and actually even as a consumer of a library, you can provide that stuff for yourself and be in a good place. So in this case, and the output's a little weird, but it's basically I'm slicing up a span that I have constructed and I'm doing it in two different ways and producing the exact same output. This is silly code, but just sort of showing that you can do this. Another one is the name of function. If you're coming from C sharp, you know exactly what this is. In this case, I have a list of months. So I'm going to look up a month by an index, an integer. Um, I could be out of bounds. And so in the case of being out of bounds, I want to throw an exception. And I want to have some interesting stuff inside of that value. So in this case, the 12th month is December. The first is January. The 13th doesn't exist. That should throw an exception. Indeed, it does. And I get parameter name month. This is exactly what I wanted. I can take the name of pretty much anything in F-sharp. I can take the name of a function, of a module, of a parameter of you know all sorts of different stuff. You can also open static classes in F sharp five. Right. I can open system .nat and just extract the value pi directly from there. It's a little awkward, but I can actually define my own uh, um, static class in F sharp. A static class is actually just a class that's abstract and sealed, so that's how you do it in F sharp code. And in this case, I can call add with the value two point zero and pi, um, and add is defined as a static method on the static class A. Boom, that's adding 2.0 to the value pi that we had earlier. The last one is something that I will post a link to so that people can read this because it's kind of conceptually heavy. But the main thing to sort of take away from this with applicative computation expressions, which is big fancy words, um, is uh, this is another tool for library authors to offer more expressive libraries for people to work with. In fact, here I have a full um, sort of mini, mini library for the result type that we have built inside of fsharp.core. And I can operate on it using some special syntax called let bang and bang and bang. And prior to fsharp 5, I could do this. The completion is a little, a little funny there. So I could do this, right, prior to fsharp 5. But this and bang is a little bit different. What it basically means is that um, it's a way to sort of tell the compiler that each of these computations that are happening here are entirely independent of one another. I cannot have one of these depend on the other one. And so what's important is that restriction actually buys you a little bit because you can enforce a kind of safety, if you will, for consumers of the library. And then on top of that, it actually allows the compiler to optimize things to be a little bit faster. So that's what we got there. There's more demo stuff here. Again, I'll, I'll make sure that there's links to this stuff for people to play around with because you're really gonna understand it best when you start executing code and reading all about it. So there's quite a lot that's going on here. There's actually some very recent work that just got merged in where we allow you to translate F -sharp code to a GPU and execute it there. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the dev build of that to work well enough in conjunction with everything else on my machine. And I didn't want to spend a ton of time, you know, constructing this Rube Goldberg machine and then have it accidentally fall apart right in front of my face uh, as I'm giving a talk. So, uh, you know, perhaps in a future talk later this year or maybe next year, I'll have a very compelling uh, executing F sharp code in different environments. So, there's a few overall takeaways, I think, that, you know, if, if you watch this, sort of what are the main things that I, that I sort of want you to, you know, walk away with? So firstly, I think F Sharp and Python share a few similarities, right? One of the main things that is apparent, especially when you're writing F Sharp code, is that you don't write a whole lot of code. Similar to Python, right? You can get a lot of stuff done without a whole lot of work. 
Um, working with collections, it's generally pretty convenient. We've made it even more convenient with F-Sharp 5, and we're hoping to find even more ways to make it convenient in the future. And we're laying the groundwork, um, or rather, I should say the groundwork has mostly already been laid for an excellent library ecosystem. It just needs a few more things. Uh, and that's something that we're focusing on with F-Sharp 5, because ultimately, if you're, if you're operating in the spaces, interactivity and analytical, analytical stuff, that Python is excelling at today, you need to have a good library ecosystem. And that's something that we recognize and we are working to sort of unblock people because that way we can enable the, the F-Sharp community and people who are just getting started with F-Sharp to be as creative as they need to be. So when I say F-Sharp is a better Python, um, it's more about F-Sharp operating in the same space that Python operates in. And I personally think that even today, it does a lot of things better than Python. Um, I think that over the next year, two years, and especially three years, that's going to become very true as we focus more and more on this. And F Sharp 5 is really the first step in, in making it awesome for interactive and analytical programming. Um, so I'm sort of saying that F Sharp 5 marks sort of a new era for the language. That isn't to say that F Sharp is, you know, you shouldn't do web programming anymore or, you know, oh, you should only use it for science and machine learning and all that sort of stuff. Um, because, you know, Python isn't used exclusively for those things either. So we think it's already great for the web. We think it's going to become even better for interactive and analytical programming. And the next version of F Sharp, F Sharp 5, and then the following versions coming after that, it's going to be even better. At least that's what we're what we're shouting for. So if you want to get started today, just you know, try things out. You know, see where there are gaps. Tell us what those gaps are. That sort of stuff. Um, you can get started. There's just a simple link, aka.ms/fsharphome. Uh, what this does, this takes you to the FSharp Home page on the .NET website. Uh, there's a big old button on there that you can click to download. Uh, there's a little tutorial that shows you how to do like a little Hello World app, things like that. Um, but this will give you the .NET Core installation to sort of get going. Um, and in the channel, I will post some links for how you can get started specifically with Jupyter Notebooks, VS Code Notebooks, um, and F Sharp for the web. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been pretty good, and I'm glad that the, the dev build that I've been using for the demo didn't totally blow up in my face right as I was presenting. So uh, my prayer to the demo gods was heard, uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, I have, it looks like a few more minutes. Um, so what I will do is check to see if I have any questions so far. Um, <laughs> somebody said, let the cat in. Uh, let's see. Let's see if the cat wants to kill me. Come here, Caramel. No. <sighs> Unfortunately, Richard, um, the cat doesn't want to come in right now. She's looking very cute just outside the door, and that's, that's the way that she's going to be, I guess. Um, Sorry, I, I wish there was a big old fuzzball that I could just hold up to the camera and say, oh, look how cute this cat is. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, looking forward to F-Sharp 5. Yes, I'm also looking forward to F-Sharp 5. Uh, it's, it has been a lot of work going into it so far, and uh, um, I'm really excited for later this year um, when we can uh, finalize some of it. Oh, speaking, yep. oh, hello, come here. Here we go. Got the, got the kitty. She came here after all. She's a little she's a little camera shy. Um. <laughs> see, working on a Python parser in F sharp. That's really cool. Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think the other thing is there. There's sort of a roadmap for F sharp five, if you will. Um, we are. You know, we're, we're trying to, so I, I actually have on my to-do list for this week to write another blog post for the .NET blog. Um, I'm going to just sort of talk about a few additional little tweaks for the latest .NET 5 preview that we've done um, and lay out, I think, a little bit more things that we're planning for the next set of previews. And then right now, we're still in the preview cycle. So um, every month, there's a .NET 5 preview. And in that .NET 5 preview, there's some updates to F-Sharp 5. Uh, later this year, we're probably thinking around maybe August, 
um, we're going to be closing down on F sharp five and uh, really just foc focusing on stabilizing what we have. And so when that happens, um, we'll, there'll be a blog post that that sort of recaps all the things that are available, and it'll it'll start to, it'll emphasize a lot more like how to use it in Jupyter notebooks, how to use it in VS Code notebooks, things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think at that point, like right now, it's it's at a point where if you want to preview some stuff, try it out, just sort of get a feel for how using F Sharp in this space is like. It's definitely good for that. Um, but later this year is when things are going to be stabilizing some more, and you will be able to sort of legitimately do some work with F Sharp five and and you know have have what you're doing be supported. Okay, let's see, got another question here from Ode. Um, hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, can you comment on how to mix, say, Python and F Sharp in a notebook? That's a good question. This is something that we're still trying to figure out. Okay, Caramel. Um, sorry, my cat's name is Caramel. So that's why I uh, said that. Um, so how can, can I comment on how to mix, say, Python and F Sharp in a notebook? So today, um, I don't think it, there might be a dev build that I could throw together that shows it working, but it, it doesn't quite work yet. Um, what we're going to ultimately be doing is um, exporting some stuff. Actually, you know what? Let me let me just very briefly do this. Um, do some 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 nonsense right here. Okay, so I'm going to create a cell. We're going to call it a shipper. I'm going to call it message. Hello, my cat is named Caramel. Okay. Oh. Oops, <laughs> I typed up the that doesn't work. Okay. Shift enter. Okay, I got a message. Now I'm in C Sharp Interactive. So I'm going to go shebang share from F Sharp message display. I think I typed this right. Cool, there we go. So um, let's just walk through what I just did here. So this is F sharp code, and I have a value called message. I, this is C sharp interactive, actually, that is executing in this cell. And I have this, this special command called share dash dash from F sharp, and then the name of the, the value, we're calling it variable sharing. And I can just use it from C sharp. This is kind of the way that, that we're going to be sort of trying to share things. Right, so you can imagine instead of this being a C sharp um, cell, this could be a Python cell, and maybe there's a shebang here. We're not quite sure on the design yet. It might be, you know, this special comment that sort of says, "Hey, you can share this value," or there may be like a magic value that you can access. Right, and maybe there's like a variable or like a handle to the notebook itself, and you could say, "Okay, in the notebook, find me the F sharp values, and then get me the value that has this particular name." Um, you know, it might be something might look something like this, you know, notebook dot values dot F sharp dot get value something from F sharp, right? And, you know, I might be able to type something like that in Python code and then get the value and start doing stuff. And under the covers, this something from F sharp would be serialized as JSON. And then so this get value would actually deserialize the JSON. Um, into something that Python could understand. There's there's still some design work that we're going to have to do to sort of enable that and get it into a place that we um, are happy with. So I don't know if mixing Python and F Sharp in the same notebook is something that's going to ship as GA. Um, like that capability might be preview later this year, whereas the rest of everything else is GA. Um, but this is like one of the major things that we want to go after because we definitely recognize that you can't like in a lot of cases, you can't just go all in on .NET and, and F Sharp. You have to mix different things together. And we want to make that as frictionless as possible. So um, that was my long-winded answer, but hopefully it gives a little bit of insight into uh, what we're trying to do. OK, so I got like one more minute left. Um, so here's the deal. It's the morning for me right now. Uh, I actually woke up at 6 to be able to give this talk. Um, I, I, once this talk is over, I will be eating some breakfast. Uh, but then after that, I will be in the um, the Slack for the rest of the day to take some further questions. You can DM me uh, directly here. Uh, the name should just be Philip Carter. Um, 
or you know, uh, I, I think there's there's like you know, if you want to set up some sort of uh, you know specific chat with me or something like that, um, the the fine folks here at NDC can set that up for us, and I'm happy to answer any questions, talk in further detail about things, that sort of stuff. Okay, well, my time is up. So I think I will stop sharing my screen here. And there we go. All right, that worked pretty well, actually. I'm surprised that there were not too many hiccups aside from just that one, uh, you know, my screen share just sort of disappearing for a brief moment. So thank you very much uh, for, for attending and um, yeah, I'll see you around.